Okay, welcome to a virtual tour of the Baylands. Here's a map of the Baylands Park in Palo Alto. And for most of our tour, we're going to be up here in this area. First, we're going to park right in this parking lot here. This is the view as you're in the parking lot of the Baylands Park. It's a big salt marsh, almost 2,000 acres of mudflats, salt marsh, and estuary habitats. So we're going to walk down this boardwalk, and I'm just going to let you listen to the, all the birds that are here in the Baylands. Okay, so we just transitioned from, from the parking lot, which is sort of a, a higher elevation, through the mud, through a little bit of uh, salt marsh onto the mud flats, and now we're looking at water draining out of the estuary. This is at a pretty low tide, um, and water's, water's leaving um, these uh, streams and going into the estuary. Critically, um, these habitats are really productive, and so um, it's... Uh, really unique for us in in the Bay Area to have such a beautiful area um, that's been protected from development. And so as we walk um, along the road in, in the Baylands Park, you can see this really extensive salt marsh. And these salt marshes are very productive habitats. Um, there's a lot of photosynthesis going on, a lot of carbon capture from, from the air and um, using sunlight for that carbon capture. But they're really low diversity habitats these habitat this is during low tide um, but these habitats get regularly flooded by salt water from san francisco bay estuary and salt water is toxic to plants um, having salt on their roots is very bad for them and so most plants can't survive this um, harsh habitat so what we see is relatively low diversity of plant life in the salt marshes although high productivity you can see that there's a, for the most part, the plants are covering 100% of the space, except where it's flooded, um, and right now at low tide. And one of the major plants here in the Baylands is called pickleweed. And this is pickleweed. It's kind of got a fleshy sort of succulent um, morphology, and it can dominate up to 100% cover of a lot of the, the solid land in this salt marsh. Um, Pickleweed has adaptations to get rid of salt. And then the other plant that survives in, in this habitat is cordgrass. Pickleweed and cordgrass can regularly get flooded um, by seawater during high tides. And these plants have adapted to tolerate high salt concentrations. Um, this the, the, that special adaptation to survive in, in salty areas is really critical for all the other creatures that live in the salt marsh. And so there's a ton of little invertebrates that burrow in the mud. Um, there's a lot of birds that, that look for little creatures in the mud and eat plants um, and, and just are, are foraging on anything they can find. And so this um, 
almost 2,000 acres in Palo Alto is actually a key habitat for birds uh, because it's so rare in, in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, there's less than 1% of this salt marsh left. And so the Baylands is really well known um, as a place for bird wildlife watching, um, bird watching. There's a lot of different kind of birds that come here, some that fly through um, on their um, migration north, um, and some birds that are permanent residents. And there's a whole suite of different birds that either eat um, the invertebrates in the mud um, or the insects flying around this habitat. Um, and critically, these birds are... Uh, and critically, this habitat, especially this marshy area here in, in kind of the middle of the Baylands Park, um, is very important for this bird life. And you can kind of see as we lock, walk along the road, we're heading towards the visitor center, um, that the road has been uplifted from the salt marsh. And so we've added one or two feet of elevation, and you can see the plants change at higher elevation. And this is because these plants aren't exposed to salt water as often. And so normal plants can live in these higher elevations and they're much better competitors than the pickleweed or the cordgrass. And so it ends up that um, salt marsh um, plants don't aren't very good competitors because uh, they've evolved to tolerate salinity in, instead of competing with other plants. And so we see this sort of exclusive exclusion zone where um, the salt marsh plants don't come to higher elevations uh, but we get a lot more diversity of plants at higher elevations um, because they're not exposed to regular flooding of their roots by seawater during high tide and so the diversity of the salt marsh is quite low in terms of plants but again the productivity is really high um, there's a lot of photosynthesis going on here and that supports the whole food web in in the entire bay area ecosystem so the estuary itself and an estuary is where fresh and salt water meet um, is really productive because there's a lot of nutrients coming in from fresh water so there's a lot of primary productivity going on a lot of photosynthesis and this productivity supports all sorts of little invertebrates that live in the mud um, fish and higher trophic um, creatures like like sharks and and larger fish that are predators and this salt marsh is actually a really important source of carbon into the estuary so as these salt marsh plants die um, their carbon sort of rolls downhill into the mud flat and and gets into the estuary and, and it's it's um eaten by detritivores, so snails and bacteria, and those are all processing carbon and um, helping to, to support the food web. They're the foundation of the food web. So now we're walking along the road towards the visitor center, um, and this is a really pretty part of, of the Baylands Park. The Lucy Evans Nature Center is really a great resource for students. Um, has a lot of nice displays. You can see it there at the top of the screen. Um, this visitor center um, has uh, visitors from, from school classrooms that come and a whole suite of uh, people who come and just walk around the Baylands and, and enjoy being outside for a little while. Um, again, you can see in this salt marsh habitat that it's really dominated by these two plants, um, cordgrass and pickleweed. Uh, you can see the pools, the sort of muddy pools in the background. Because it's such low tide today, those pools don't have any seawater in them. Um, but when at high tide, they will be full of water, um, just sort of like this little estuary is. Um, this tidal basin is also at low tide, but you can see uh, the mud flats have been exposed. Uh, but know that these mud flats are also really rich areas of diversity and so there's a ton of you can kind of see the brown green slime on the top that's um an algae that's photosynthesizing and capturing carbon um and that algae is providing food for all sorts of invertebrates and grazers and crabs um, that live both on the surface of the mud the epifauna and those invertebrates that burrow into the mud the infauna and the ones that burrow into the mud are, are usually um, worms and clams and filter feeders. And so they stick their um, snouts out of the mud and then they can collect food um, from the water as it passes over them. 
And so here's a nice view of the Lucy Evans Visitor Center. Um, the Visitor Center provides habitat for some creatures because it's structure in this um, salt marsh. And so um, they've actually built uh, small nesting boxes um, for swallows. And so you can see here some of the swallows are, are um, flying through the visitor center in this time lapse video. Um, and you can see that, that there's some um, people making use of the park. Uh, this is a pretty early morning um, in April. Okay, now behind the visitor center is this really beautiful boardwalk that goes out for I don't know how long, uh, 200 yards maybe, 300 yards, um, pretty far out from, from the from the salt marsh, across the salt marsh, you can see here, again, dominated by cord grass, which is kind of the frilly grass at the top, and pickle weed, which is all the green sort of in the middle. Um, this boardwalk is has was recently redone, um, but you can see an old boardwalk that we can't walk on anymore. I guess it's deteriorated so much um, that is there to access these um, power, these towers uh, with the, with the um, electric lines in them. But I just wanted you to see in this video how extensive the salt marsh habitat is and how extensive it should be, right? Because this, what we're looking at is only 1% of the salt marshes that should be present in, in San Francisco Bay Area. And now we're looking at over the estuary, again, it's low tide, so we're looking at these expansive mudflats that are full of both epifauna and infauna. Um, and these organisms are taking advantage of all this photosynthesis that's going on in this really productive ecosystem. During high tide, all that mud flat is covered um, and know that we are in one of the biggest estuaries in the country in San Francisco Bay and the, and the Golden Gate Bridge is the, is the opening of the bay. The bay is sort of considered to be these four units, four or five units, where most of the freshwater input is coming in from the delta. But San Francisco Bay has been altered extensively. It's been filled in. Almost half of the area that used to be salt marshes is all filled in. Um, this area, whoops. This area at the top, um, across the bay from from um, the Baylands, used to be a salt uh, factory, and now they're talking about restoring that. And so, what's really special about Baylands Park is that we're looking um, at how the how the San Francisco Bay used to look like. And, and hopefully, um, after some restoration efforts, it can look like that again. Okay, now we're looking out over the estuary. It's low tide, so we're looking at the mudflats. Again, a lot of creatures live in these mudflats. That's why the birds are out here scavenging for things. Um, in this estuary, San Francisco Bay estuary has been one of the most changed places on the planet. And so it has been greatly affected by... Um, our use of freshwater. So from the Delta system, we've taken a lot of the freshwater that come, used to come into the San Francisco Bay and we've moved it for human uses, agriculture and consumption. Um, we've introduced a ton of species into the Bay um, because of our shipping traffic that goes all around the world. Um, and so it's really hard for us to know what the ecology of San Francisco Bay used to be. So, but we can use some techniques in historical ecology um, like these um, Native American middens. You can see over here at the left of, of this image are, is a midden, um, and those are shells that were left by Native Americans uh, when they used to come here and scavenge. And you can see there were a lot of oysters and clam shells there um, that we don't see so much in San Francisco Bay anymore. Um, a lot of the native oysters uh, were um, extinguished due to human harvesting during the gold rush. A lot of this fine sediment in San Francisco Bay is from um, all the mining activity that took place in the rivers um, upstream of San Francisco Bay in, in the 1800s. Um, and so uh, the, the actual foundation of the bay itself, the bottom of it, and the food webs um, that survived has been greatly altered by infilling, making land for buildings, invasive species, which has completely changed the food webs, um, and, and human extraction effectively. Okay, so as part of our field trip, we're, we're going back towards the visitor center across that long boardwalk. Um, you can see uh, here uh, past the visitor center is that boardwalk that goes out into the bay. And then we're, and then we're gonna walk out of the park um, away from the visitor center and kind of go upland and see how um, the, the vegetation is changing. And so uh, critically, I think for us is understanding that um, while this is a really beautiful park, um, 
and and it provides this really great resource for us as open space and for birds as habitat for them to stop over on their migrations or as places to forage for their for their food um, know that this park represents a very small portion of San Francisco Bay and that it's probably less than 1% of the bay looks like this with extensive salt marshes, really big mud flats, um, and, and access to the estuary during, during high tide. We can actually see the estuary sort of flood the mud flats in these, these open pools that we're looking at. So San Francisco Bay has been greatly altered by humans. Um, clearly, uh, we have a big impact on a lot of different habitats, um, but I would argue that, that this particular marine habitat, this estuary, has been greatly changed. Okay, and so as a concluding um, sort of piece to this field trip, uh, we're going to walk out of the park along the road, and you can see um, these big extensive pools that are that are pretty low at, at low tide um, and the mud flats associated with those pools but also notice that how the vegetation is is changing so as we're as we're leaving the park we're going a little bit more uphill and so the elevation is increased by a couple of feet and we're starting to see a lot more um, diversity of plants and, and that's because these plants are not regularly exposed um, to salt water during high tide. And, so, and that's because we've elevated this section of, of, the, of the path. And so um, also critically to understand about estuaries is that our human land use is really connected to the health of the system. And so if we fill in land, clearly um, there's no room for all these native species to live. So one last view over the Baylands, beautiful park. I highly recommend it. Thanks for coming um, and have a great day.